Hey everyone, Tony here. Michelle and I are going to do something a little bit different and we're going to rebroadcast an episode that we recorded as one of our first episodes with one of our first guests. We very tragically received information this past week of accidental passing of someone who is very dear to us. And we wanted to take this opportunity to pay tribute, to rebroadcast his wise words and his story, and also share a little bit about his journey since we recorded that episode. A lot has happened in his life. He has become quite the advocate. And uh, I just wanted to say that this will be a little bit of an emotional intro. So I just want to put that out there so that in case there's some emotion on our end, please bear with us. This is a tough one. I'm going to bring on Michelle. Michelle is, as a reminder, the biological daughter of Greg Hicks, our guest. And I'm going to bring her on now. Hi, everyone. I've been uh, trying to mentally prepare myself for this this morning, but I don't think you'll ever be really prepared to record something like this. But I lost my biological father, Bipa. Greg Hicks, who was in our episode last season this past weekend. And when we recorded that episode, he was a brand new vegan. That's what the episode was called. And he was just stepping into his first months of a plant-based lifestyle. We wanted to share an update for what he had been able to accomplish. In our episode, we talked a little bit about how He thought maybe he was going to make it to one year, but we are happy to say he did make it to a year. Michelle, how long was he vegan? Well over a year. We actually celebrated his one year vegan anniversary with avocado toast, but not just avocado toast. We took like a straight half avocado, stuck it on a toast and then put a candle in it. (laughs) And I love that he, I'm actually going to include a picture of this in the show notes, but he decorated it so beautifully too. He had like roses next to his avocado <laughs> toast. So he was very proud of his accomplishments. I know that his friends and family were like, are you done with this yet? You said you're going to do 30 days. And he was like, oh, I don't know. Let's stick it out. Let's see how long it goes. And and he not only stuck it out for over a year, but he really committed to it and became an advocate for the vegan diet and did an Instagram account to empower vegans. That's actually what it is. It's at empowered vegans, empower vegans. And I just thought it was really cool that he was able to learn about it and also inspire people with his story. Yeah. It's been really special since sharing his passing. I've actually been reached out to by many people who are just part of our online plant-based community who had reached out to him or who somehow connected with him in their first days or weeks or years of being vegan. And he was able to provide guidance and support and just like positive words and really touched them as individuals. So that's just so special and it's just who he was, but not only in online space, like I'm pretty much every day he would share stories of how he was at the bank or at the grocery store or, you know, wherever he's going on his errands or living his life, he would have a conversation with someone who most people just don't even really take the time to see. He would have a conversation with his grocery checkout person and would share documentaries or communicate in a really positive, bright, happy way about the plant-based lifestyle, which is just so beautiful. He left such a, a wave of just positivity and change and inspiration through all of the people that he met and touched in that way, which is really beautiful. And not only that, he was a big fan of veganizing everyone's favorite <laughs> foods, including a recipe that Michelle and I are including in our upcoming cookbook. I am really thrilled that we get to honor him and his family in that way. He cooked or he baked a recipe called Grandma's Cookies, where he and Michelle veganized a family favorite. So these are cookies that my grandma made since he was little growing up. And everyone in the family loves these cookies. Everyone in the neighborhood would beg for these cookies. They just have become like the most well-known cookies in in anyone who knew the Hicks family. And as Bipa, I think in the last in the last episode, he had just made his very first vegan pizza. And soon after that, we just started cooking together and sharing recipes. And every Monday night we'd have wine nights where we'd try a new vegan recipe, new food, explore things. And he got inspired to try and veganize some of his family favorites. So 
the grandma's cookies was one of those. He made so many batches of them to perfect them and got to the point where he was able to bring them to his family and do a side-by-side taste test with my grandma's actual cookies. And everybody loved them. And so that recipe is now on World of Vegan. And he wrote that article and that blog post. And he's since contributed several recipes for meatball subs, which are just so insanely amazing. And meat lovers tacos and more as he's been going on this journey. And something Michelle didn't mention, but is really a funny part of the story is that Michelle lives in Sacramento and Greg lives in Orange (laughs) County. So when she says we cooked together on Monday nights, they did it on the phone. (laughs) (laughs) My husband would go to Dungeons and Dragons. Oh no, he's outed on the podcast. <laughs> he has a group that he a- attends in Oakland. Yeah. So he and would be so out of town. I would have these open nights and we would jump on the phone as we did pretty much every day at some point as we were doing mundane tasks of life and just talk and hang out together. And so Monday nights became our sort of sacred wine and cooking nights. And it was it was really beautiful. I actually encourage any of you listening who may feel like cooking is a chore because that's had felt that way to me a little bit, but bringing someone along and just like putting in your earphones or your earbuds or whatever, and being able to cook with someone, even if they can't be there in person is such a a beautiful connective experience. Were you making the same thing or was whatever you guys wanted to? Whatever we wanted, it was a different thing all the time. And at World of Vegan, we come out with a new recipe every week. So sometimes we'd pick those recipes. Some of our favorites were the lasagna soup at World of Vegan. He would make, when he found something he loved, <laughs> he really loved it. I actually just found an email that I forwarded to Tony that was, that I had sent to Bipa when he first was stepping into his first week of plant-based. And it was like your customized meal plan. So like what, what you can eat for breakfast and lunch and dinner and dessert and snacks. And on there, I remember being like, when you're ready for a fancier breakfast, you can try tofu scramble. And so he pretty much instantly jumped into wanting to try a tofu scramble. And since that first day making it would make it like four times a week for the rest of time to come. (laughs) And so along our cooking adventures, we found many favorites. One pot pasta, which is on World of Vegan. He made that like once or twice a week. It was just, yeah, it was really special, (laughs) special time. Michelle mentioned that Greg also was part of World of Vegan and regularly promoted plant-based on a budget, which I always thought was so cute. He was so (laughs) excited. He also did videos with Michelle and we're going to include those on the show notes. But Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about some of the vegan videos he created with you? Yeah. I mean, God, Bipa was up for anything. Any way to be doing creative things together or spread a positive message or just make our time together productive, he was down for. And so we started off by one time when I was down in Southern California with him, we brought over his friend, Dano, who is actually the person who hosted the Super Bowl party back in 1986, where I was conceived. (laughs) Little did he know, little did any of them know. And so that was really cool. We all jumped on on a video to compare vegan cheddar cheese taste test between a longtime vegan, a brand new vegan and someone who is not at all vegan. And so that was the first video we filmed. And then since then, he's become an even bigger part of the work we do at World of Vegan. He would connect and collaborate with brands and companies that were super aligned. And he has these friends who run a company named Tosi and they make these energy bars and they actually sponsored us, my Bipa, my brother and I to go skydiving And I wanted to show that the importance of carrying vegan snacks with you everywhere you go. And so I wanted to show eating a vegan snack in the air, jumping out of an airplane. And so we got the very special experience for his last birthday and also celebrating one year of knowing each other of jumping out of an airplane. (laughs) Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I think it was like maybe the next day that I found out I was pregnant, which is pretty funny because it is just so typical of Bipa to have taken his grandbaby skydiving before he was even born. (laughs) I'm so grateful for those videos that he's just jumped on and, and shared together. I mean, we also recorded our whole adoption story and he recorded a video about his experience finding a daughter he never knew that he had. And it's just been such a, now I'm so grateful to have all of those memories captured and something tangible that I can go back and watch and see the pieces of 
the pieces that he shared through those videos. Usually we have a call to action in all of our intros and outros. And I thought it would be nice to have Michelle give call to action based on what Greg would want. So since you know him so well, probably better than most people, what would you think he would want as a call to action (laughs) for today's episode? To him, he woke up every day with one simple goal to make someone smile that day, to make one person smile every day. And I think he probably made about 45 people smile every day at the very least. (laughs) Yeah, he would text me in the morning sometimes. And I love pandas. And everybody (laughs) who knows me knows I love pandas. And he would send me funny panda pictures. He sent one time himself wearing a panda head (laughs) stuffed animal head uh, at Walmart. (laughs) And he tell me have a fantastic day, fantastic (laughs) day. And I just thought that that was so thoughtful and it did make me smile. It was a nice way to start the day knowing that someone cared about me enough to wish me a good day. Yeah. I remember my husband one year, we were talking about our our like New Year's resolutions and for him, family is so important. And we just have find a way of kind of disconnecting more than we ever intend to. And so his one of his goals was like text someone who I love or a friend or family member every day. And it's really surprisingly hard to stay on that if you don't create the habit. But for my BPA, it was a habit. It was part of his morning routine to spend, I don't know how much time, five minutes, 10 minutes, just sending positive inspirational messages, a little ridiculous good morning bitmojis or or whatever to various people in his life. And it's now with his passing, seeing the hundreds of people who are reaching out who felt like he was a brother to them or um, a best friend to them. I mean, most people are lucky to have one best friend and about hundreds of people consider him their best friend. And that is something like such a gift that he was able to give to everyone that, that he loved. And it's a gift that I'm going to try and do better at giving to the people that I love and that all of you listening can definitely hopefully take that forward and, and just make more people smile, show the people that you care about, that you love them. And yeah, life is really just such a, it's such a gift. And I hope that this episode serves not only to inspire you along your plant-based journey and hopefully give you helpful tips, but also to remember to appreciate every day and hold your loved ones close and be there for each other. It's been really special having a lot of people in my life reach out and just share words as I'm going through this time that's more difficult than anything I've ever been through in my life. And um, I also wanted to share with those of you listening a message that was sent to me from our friend Colleen Patrick Goudreau, who is also a guest on our podcast. I know Tony has been kind of helping me in my introverted ways and reminding people that calling me is not necessarily the best, the best way. I just kind of need uh, to grieve in private, but she sent me a recorded message and we're going to play that now. I think it's really hard to know how to be there for someone as a friend in a time of loss, which is something that we all go through. We're all going to go through, especially with the holidays coming up, people who have been through loss really feel it extra heavily at this time of year. So I hope that this will help you see a beautiful example of how to be there for someone. Hello, my friend. I wanted to just reply to you. I just didn't want to do it via email and I don't want to burden you and call you, but you can call me anytime. Um, and I just wanted to say I'm, I am devastated for you and I'm quite aware of the preciousness of life and how ephemeral it is. And you're unfortunately learning that in the hardest way. And um, I, 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 of course, take from this just a heightened awareness of how we can lose our loved ones so suddenly. And I, I try to practice that every day. And of course, when I heard about Greg, I, it just hits home even more. And, uh, that's the hardest part is that, yeah, what, you know, what you were able to share, I'm so grateful for you. And I know it's just such a surreal story. I mean, it's such a beautiful story in this 
in a terribly tragic way. Um, but I think it just really characterizes how precious time is and how we can't control things and how we have to just make the most of everything we have. And of course you did with him. And I'm really glad you had that time together. And I see your post and it reminds me of when Michael died and just wanting to capture them and hold on to them. And the only way we can do it is through our memory and through the visual reminders and the video reminders of who they were. And you will continue to do that. And you will be so grateful to have had those physical reminders besides what you have in your memory. And it will make you laugh and it will make you smile and it will make you cry and it will make you sad and it will make you grateful and it will make you all those things. And that will never end. And one thing that I urge you to do as time goes on and now is to encourage your friends and family to not be afraid of saying his name and talking about him. Because I remember with Michael, people are so afraid of, you know, conjuring up his name because it was so, you know, because it's so sad. And I, you just want to keep them alive and you want to keep them here. And the only way we can do that is through our memory. And so saying his name and talking about him and uh, which you will do and you are doing, I'm seeing it. Um, just letting others know that it's okay to say it and it's more than okay. It actually keeps him here. So I love you and call me anytime. I would, I'm happy to come to Sacramento. Please let me know if you need anything at all now and as time goes on. Um, but I would love to see you and I just want to completely envelop you and, and just let you know you're loved and, and Greg continues to love you. Those are beautiful words by Colleen. I expect nothing less. She's such a magician with words. So hopefully you got something out of those words of comfort as well. Before we jump into the episode, while Michelle is right here in front of me, I wanted to ask, is there anything you would like to say to Greg that you want memorialized forever on this podcast episode? Give me like 40 minutes to just cry my eyes out. (laughs) (laughs) It's just... Not many people are lucky enough to have someone who really sees them. And I know a lot of us, especially who are aware of the tragedies of the world, to animals, to our planet, to all those things, carry that individually and don't have their loved ones possibly ever really understand and be there for them and and be a part of that. And be proud just that you saw that. And took the time to learn about the things that I cared about. (laughs) And really embrace them in your heart. Both because you knew how important they were to me, but also because they became so important to you. Means everything to me. And it's a big reason why we became so close. We just, when you really care about someone... You care about who they care about and you care about what they care about. And I really wish for all of those listening that you are so lucky to find someone who can be that for you the way that Beepa has been that for me. Thank you, Michelle. We're going to go into the episode now. Greg, thanks so much for coming on to our show today. So happy to have you here. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tony. It's good to be here with you today. Today, I would love to start off with Michelle telling a little bit about the backstory, and then we can talk a little bit more about your plant-based journey and how it stemmed from the story Michelle's about to tell. All right. So Greg, aka Bipa, is my birth father, my biological father, who I just met for the first time a few months ago at age 31. I was adopted as a baby. And he had no idea I existed on this planet until I uh, crashed into his life and said, knock, knock on Facebook. (laughs) I think you might have a biological daughter out there and it might be me. Um, And it was. So that's, yeah. I really loved 
the story. It is going viral on the internet. Michelle created a video that you can see on her YouTube channel. And from my perspective, basically she had been on this journey for ever to find her biological parents. And she found her mom 10 years ago. Then 10 years later, with the help of DNA testing, found a second cousin, no, first cousin, first cousin, a first cousin, reached out to her first cousin who gave her some leads. Then there was some Facebook stalking that ensued. <laughs> then and Tony very much helped me with. <laughs> <laughs> then there was an awkwardly worded letter that Tony also helped me with. <laughs> <laughs> and next I knew she was on this beautiful journey of reconnection with her biological father. And they spent a lot of time talking, getting to know each other. Then Michelle and her husband flew down to meet her whole family in person, where they welcomed her with open arms and just showed so much kindness and love. And I know that's not the story for all adopted babies. So I'm so glad that that happened to Michelle and to Greg. But yeah, so then Greg, you meet Michelle. She's like, hey, I'm a vegan. Then what? (laughs) Then what? I feel like I tried to play the vegan card kind of cool and be like, not super vegan, except for it was like my website, my profile, my job. It was all just like world vegan, (laughs) vegan, vegan, vegan. And I'm like, oh no, like I I found my birth father and he's going to think I'm some crazy vegan. (laughs) Well, and with my family all being carnivores, meat eaters, (laughs) <laughs> and uh, having you come down and visit and having a big meat fest barbecue celebration when you landed, that's when you kind of cleared things up that you were vegan. I say that in jest. No, I, uh, those first few days of anxiety and who is this person that's dropping into my life and being curious and looking to learn more about you and stuff like that, obviously, was very quickly very aware of your passions and what your life's all about. And very compassionate in the space. And so, yeah, I always, well, probably since I was uh, 1920, somewhere around there, I kind of got into some nutritional elements in my life that kind of always been attracted toward toward the wellness space, but never to the level of vegetarian or vegan. I didn't really comprehend that part of the equation as um, being so, I guess I was programmed like so many others that milk is good for your body and cut back on your red meat and eat more chicken. (laughs) So I guess in exploring a little bit more about who you were and then in some of our conversations, being re-enlightened to look into some documentaries like What the Health and just I was uh, in in a place, I guess, in my life that it was, I felt the need to kind of man up and take responsibility to the next level for my health. And so I was motivated in that direction for healthy reasons first. And so that's kind of where it started. I don't remember if you recall, I was doing some shopping and I called for a consult (laughs) to Michelle because they were sampling some veggie patties and I was getting some information about that. And she was kind of helping steer me into some better choices. And after putting a few things in my cart, I just decided that with her coming down in a couple of weeks, so why don't I become a a project for you, do a two-week project. And you're like, no, no, I can't ask you to do that. And I insisted that was a, I was volunteering. You weren't asking, so. It was an interesting time that we found each other because Tony and I had just been working on a, our mini documentary with Raul, who had gone plant-based from a standard American fast food-based diet for a week. And so you got to witness everything we were sharing with him his transformation. You were giving him words of encouragement and support. And I think it was like during or after, right when we were kind of Mm -hmm. in the midst of filming that, that you were like, I'll be your next project. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I had already been kind of blown away that when we connected, I think you had said you had watched Forks Over Knives already and, and you were so deeply embedded already into the health and wellness space, which was really cool to learn because that was so much of part of my work. So to have that in common was really cool. But also, you were already pretty well educated on on many elements of health, and you are so open to eagerly absorbing every new documentary and book and and doctor and everything that came up in our conversation. Like the next time we talk, you'd be like, "Oh yeah, I was just listening to that ebook the other day." <laughs> so that's been pretty cool. Hey Greg, I'm wondering your 
experience with vegan before? Like, what did you think about it? What would come to your mind when you thought of a person who was vegan? Or when you thought of vegan, what came to your mind? Well, for me, I had some pressures with a health condition and a severe flare-up a few years back that um, led me to really bland out my diet and slowly introduce things back. And the first, I actually had two of those episodes um, that were that severe. The first time I was able to kind of get myself righted and I seemed to have reincorporated just about everything, the foods that I grew up with and loved, whether that been pizzas, steaks, uh, you know, just cheese, all kinds of typical American diet foods and pushed myself, you know, kind of hard. I felt better. I was doing better. I was, you know, utilizing some su- supplements and whatnot that seemed to control my situation. So it wasn't until the next time around where I had something trigger another flare up that, you know, you lose 50, 60 pounds in a matter of, you know, a month, month and a half and stuff like that. It's a pretty dramatic turn. And, and that one was a lot harder to get turned back around. And so my wife at the time, she was, you know, trying to get me off of all meats and headed into that at least vegetarian direction. And I just, I struggled with it. I was never a big vegetable eater. You know, there was a handful of different vegetables that I liked, but for the most part, I was, wasn't some I worked to incorporate into my daily meals. And so I just, I felt like it was such a dramatic shift and change that how was I possibly going to do this? And it seemed like that when I did have more vegetarian or perhaps even vegan at the time type dishes, it was unsatisfying. Yeah, I told somebody here recently that I was talking about, you know, the last few months of being, you know, vegan. And I said, gosh, I really picked the right time to to make this decision and do this because it's just seem, seems to me that it's a whole different world of choices and advancements and call it, you know, food science and and whatnot to bring at least through the process some comfort foods into the equation that don't leave you out there just feeling like you've, you know, you're gnawing on weeds and cardboard or something like that. Do you feel comfortable elaborating on what a flare up is? Um, sure. I have ulcerative colitis and uh, it's a autoimmune disorder in the gut, Crohn's colitis, kind of sister diseases, IBS, a number of different ones in the in the gut. When it flares, it's like having cold sores, canker sores in the inside or inner lining of your um, intestines. So anything that's passing through there feels like just excruciating. So you, you don't want to eat. You don't want to <laughs> cause anything to have to go through you. And so it's your system is not taking the nutrients in. And that's where the rapid weight, weight loss comes in. And so I fought really hard to not go on hardcore medications or what I see to be hardcore medications and immunosuppressant drugs and stuff. I was able to get through the first round, the first time not having to, but the second time around with all my exhaustive efforts, I just wasn't getting the flare to turn. So I ended up going on immunosuppressant medication, but I chose a doctor at least that was of the same mindset that I wouldn't be on it for life, that I could get on it, correct my situation. It would be a few years, but then I could wean off. And that's the process I'm in right now. So another motive to further support my body in a healthy way so that as I'm weaning off this medication, that I can stay off of it and have my body functioning the way it was intended to do. I think it's interesting too, how when you were first in your extreme flare and encouraged to eat vegetarian to help that situation, it seemed very much like you were eating bland food and sacrificing. And the perspective that I've been hearing from you now that you are not in a state of flair or in a position where you really need to physically go vegan, it seems like you're finding a lot more enjoyment in your food. I know part of that is just the advancements and you there's amazing food out there <laughs> and you have an awesome guide. But um, <laughs> that I think that the perspective that you have in your mind and like the outlook that you have in your mind when you step into going plant-based is so important. And if you go in with a positive mindset, you're going to have a probably a pretty good experience. And if you go in with a negative mindset, expecting it to suck, (laughs) it probably will. I feel like that's everything. When you wake up in the morning and you're like, Oh, I have to go to work. It's Monday. Then your whole day, your Monday is just a drag. But if you 
wake up and you say, I'm really thankful I have a job and I don't have to worry about looking for a job or what I'm going to feed my family (laughs) or my rent or, or those types of things, then you go to work feeling gratitude and with a positive outlook on life. You know, the point you brought up too, Michelle, that it, at the time that I was blanding out my diet and just stripping it down to, you know, boiled chicken, uh, broth soups, no um, sauces, no condiments. No, I mean, it was just very neutralized. And then at that point in time, when it's like, okay, so now without the help of any spices and sauces and whatnot, let's introduce you to getting off of meat too. And so maybe that was weighed into that equation of just the blandness. And this time around, going into it with excitement and with, like you said, a a good guide, you know, and for somebody that's stepping into that desire or stepping into this space and wanting to be healthier by going whole food plant-based, you know, there's uh, a lot of great cookbooks out there. There's a lot of great content online and stuff like that to to make your food good. And what I quickly learned, because I think in the first two weeks, I had agreed to a two-week project to do blood tests before and after, to do two weeks, you know, full cold turkey vegan. And I was one week into that, I think, when I told you, you know, two weeks isn't long enough. I want to go 30 days. And I know you were thrilled, but I mean, it was a very easy decision for me to make because of the experience I was having within the first week. I mean, food was tasting good. I was making pasta that instead of chicken had tofu or a plant-based chicken or sausage or crumble that made it just as satisfying, but a lot healthier. And so when I realized, hey, I'm getting the health that I want, and I'm not really sacrificing (laughs) because I'm still enjoying great pasta and stir fries. And I mean, the tofu scramble that you taught me how to make was just off the charts. I'm like, huh, I don't need to have eggs to make this taste good. And what I quickly started to realize, and over the course of weeks, becoming a couple months and stuff like that, I mean, I think that first month, well, the first couple of months here, I mean, I've personally prepared more vegetables for myself in the, in the last couple of months than I've personally prepared for myself in the last two to three decades. Woo! So Your doctors a, everywhere are cheering. It's a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a big shift. And when you're putting that good stuff in your body, that was our bodies were intended to be consuming, you know, good things start to happen. You know, I wasn't really looking to lose weight but I shed some additional body fat. I was feeling lighter. You know, I love to run, jump. You know, when I'm moving forward, I like to move forward fast, I guess. And the last, I don't know, a couple of decades of even, it just seems like I was sluggish. And, you know, to get off the ground in a, at a sun that, you know, does flips and jumps everywhere and to try to keep up with him was challenging. I feel a lot better. My energy's up. I, you know, I feel lighter and able to move better. So, it's been great all around. I'm really um, enjoying the process. And it's been a great opportunity for you and I to connect on a greater and deeper level through the process of getting to know one another, as well as this, you know, personal journey of altering or modifying my my lifestyle uh, to plant based. Yeah, I know a lot of people listening probably might feel envious of this, because for most people getting a parent to go plant-based or to align in food choices is a big struggle that people deal with. And so I feel incredibly lucky that you stepped into this path on your own. And um, it's been so fun going through that together. Well, and I truly feel grateful to have had your support through this process, encouragement, and um, and it all started with inspiration. You inspired me to do so. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And knowing that it's something that will make you here on this planet even longer, especially since I missed out on the first 31 years, years of that. That's pretty cool, too. It's fascinating because as people around me that have either known me for, you know, all my life or decades or even a short time, uh, people at the gym and whatnot. And when they observe or they, hurt, you know, they learn that I'm doing this and I'm doing the plant based thing and whatnot. I'm picking up a lot of stories from moms that are freaked out because their kids are vegan and where are they going to get their protein? And, you know, all concerned that their kids are going to get sick. And I'm like, I look at them and I go, really? <laughs> I, need to, I need to help educate you because your kids, you should be following what your kids are doing. <laughs> they should let them lead the way. I think it's fantastic. I think there's a lot of confusion out there. And so, you know, as I move forward in my own journey, I'm inspired also to uh, empower others with 
knowledge and resources to make it an easier process for them the way that you have for me. And um, I'm excited about that as well. So it's been pretty cool. Greg, you mentioned that there are lots of really great books and recipes available to you. Do you have any particular recommendations for just general resources that you could get that you go to? I think that you both have great platforms with great resources, and that's where it started for me. And I would say, you know, plant based on a budget is awesome because you know a lot of people out there also have that mindset of, oh gosh, going organic or you know going vegan or whatever is going to be super pricey. How can I deal with that? But you know, when you stop putting meat and dairy in your cart, all of a sudden that frees up a whole lot of money to redirect in a in a better way and a healthier way. In a more sustainable way. So I think that you both offer through World of Vegan and uh, Plant Based on a Budget, great starting points to springboard off, whether you're looking to do something on a more affordable path or for some people, money's not the option. They just want it to taste good. They want it to be painless and, you know, step into it and kind of sift through what's out there to find the kind of things that you're going to like. I had, I made my first, first pizza a few nights ago and it was awesome. I was actually quite impressed, and I shared it with a friend that um, has been very standoffish toward the whole food plant phase that I've been going through, but he's been curious here more recently after getting part of a documentary down, kind of raised his antennas a little bit, and I gave him a slice of the pizza, and he uh, he's like, wow, tastes like pizza. That's really awesome. Speaking of documentaries, Michelle told me told me that on her last visit to uh, Southern California, you did a, an epic documentary marathon. Do you have any favorites? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I actually feel a little bad about that. I think I I pulled all of the traumati- most traumatizing documentaries possible. We watched Dominion. We watched Shark Water. We watched Blackfish. Oh, my gosh. Um, oh, my God. We watched The Cove. I thought for some reason that you were watching Veducated and Works Overnight. Well, he had already watched all those okay. before I got there. <laughs> There's a couple of those that I, I still have yet to get Recover into. From. Yeah, but um, Forks Over Knives, I watched back, I think, during or right after my first flare up around that time. But what the, what the health most recently, I'd say that had the greatest impact. That was what I needed to really jar me into a direction of, you know what, it's time, you know, it's time to just buck up, smarten up, and reprogram myself. Through this process, another thing that I've found, and actually I learned after I started the process, but a lot of the influencers and whatnot that I've kind of started tagging into and and checking out, talk about how your palate starts to change. And it's really true that that's been happening for me. So I'm eating things that I probably would have just, you know, rolled my nose up at and (laughs) turned around, or when somebody wasn't looking, scraped off my plate or whatever. But I'm finding ways to incorporate it where it's delicious, enjoyable. And even some of them, some of the things I would say, even if it's not like, oh, you know, super savory or whatever, it's not. If I'm seeing the health benefits and it's not really that hard to get down, I guess Brussels sprouts would be one of those, you know. But I put in a good pasta dish and cook it long enough and it just kind of blends in with everything else. And I know some people absolutely love those things. And and probably I can figure out a way or we'll learn a way in the future to um, roast them or bake them or do some magical thing to make them wonderful because a lot of people rave about them in certain ways they're cooked. I tried to make him Brussels sprouts when he was here visiting and I completely burnt them, like charred them. And it, that was like going to be the, look, you'll love Brussels sprouts now. And he's like, mmm, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's like if anything, I'll tell you, if, if I went down to the meat department at the local grocery store and grabbed a big slab of meat that I would have loved in the old day and come here and throw it on the grill without any condiments, without any marinating, you know, it's going to be a different experience. And when I was cooking meat, I mean, we were always marinating our meats and we were doing all these fantastic things to to make those things take taste good. And it's the same way with a plant-based diet. If you learn a few tricks, you incorporate some of the things you like. A few days back, I also had some hot wings with a, uh, I think it was a Beyond Meat, meatless chicken strips. But I turned it into making hot wings out of them, and they were really good. And I was like, wow, I don't have to, you know, go to the local hot wing spot <laughs> to um, satisfy that craving if I have it ever, you know. Football season's right around the corner, and those kind of things will probably help in circumstances where I'm with a group that, you know, is slamming a bunch of hot wings or 
pizzas or you know all the other comfort foods that we used to eat in in those type environments. So I'm learning the types of things that I can I can either prepare for myself in advance or prepare for a group that quite frankly some of these people wouldn't even know that they were eating you know not meat. Speaking of football, Michelle and I wrote a very serious football jingle <laughs> for one of our videos. We were, Super Bowl video. We were doing a, a Super Bowl snack video. And Michelle, do you want to sing? Wait, how does it even go? Shoot. Uh, are you ready for you. some football? <laughs> are you ready, ready for you? you? <laughs> oh, yeah, we, not, this should not be our career. I think she was playing the guitar, too. Were you playing oh, the guitar? Probably, yeah, it had a broken string, too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're going to have to play that fancy. for you sometime. Yeah. Okay. So another time. That, that's we learn in an interview like this. This is fantastic. <laughs> I didn't know you played guitar. Uh, try, tried to and failed is, is more accurate there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, when you're visiting here, another fun thing that I like to remind you of often is that it was 4th of July. Tony was over. And we have on camera you saying that you were going to stay vegan for a whole oh my gosh. year. Let me... Let me find that clip so we can insert it oh right my, here. Oh, yes. Okay. So, okay, we have that on camera. So, obviously, that's going to happen, even though you don't remember saying it. <laughs> You're going to be... One year, guys. One year. <laughs> Woo! And, be, and beyond. My question for you is, do you think about going back? Would you... Can you see yourself switching back and just being like, that was a fun experiment? What are your feelings on that? Honest feelings. I won't judge. <laughs> My honest feelings on, on going back. Um, you know, I've had people ask me that. I hit 30 days and, you know, um, one of my closest friends that's been, you know, intimately watching this process was like, all right, shall I go get some uh, some fillets and be ready to celebrate? And I said, no, not really. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm, I don't see a need to go, you know, change my course at the moment. A number of times I've had that conversation come up and I kind of liken it to, um, you know, I'm not a cigarette smoker, but I imagine for people that are cigarette smokers, it's an addiction and it's hard to quit because I've watched a lot try. I've seen some have success, you know, just going cold turkey and most don't though. And liken it to the fact that if I was a smoker and I quit and I didn't have cravings and I wasn't feeling, you know, jittery or going through withdrawals or whatever, and I said I was going to quit, but I was going to do it baby steps and I start 30 days. Well, if I hit 30 days and I'm doing fine. I'm not needing it, wanting it, craving it, whatever. And somebody says, great, you're ready to celebrate and want to put another cigarette in my hand. I'm going to say, absolutely not. I'm, you know, I see no need. I, I'm fortunate. I don't have to go in and out and in and out and in and out. I made this choice for wellness and, and for my own personal wellness and, and that first. And the knowledge that's come along the way in sustainability and just the insane resources that are used to raise meats for, you know, a country and now a world that just has, seems to have an insatiable appetite for that. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I, you know, part of what I think of is what are we going to leave our, our planet like to our kids and our grandkids? And so whether it's doing it slow or doing it fast for the other listeners out there, you know, whether you do one day a week, you know, day or something like that, any small steps you take, make a huge lasting impact on the planet and the rest of the world. So if you don't care enough about yourself, but you love other people, you know, do it for the rest of us, I guess. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not looking to go back. I also am not looking to beat myself up if, you know, I find myself in a place where I have the need to have a treat or something here or there. I'm not feeling that now and I'm not looking to feel it. But if I do, I'm not going to beat myself up over it. But I'm looking to stay the course and make an impact going forward, um, not just on myself, but on others and um, I'll leave the planet better for my kids than it would be if I didn't do this. Michelle, thanks you. I'm just like smiling off in the corner here. <laughs> uh, well, with that beautiful sentiment, I mean, that, that's awesome. That's a mic drop. Should we, should, mic drop. Done. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming onto our podcast and sharing your story. I am so inspired by both you and Michelle, and I feel the love and connection that you all feel, and I'm grateful to be part of a, your journey with you. Yeah, Tony was there through the early days. Well, even just a few years ago when I'd be having, before we connected, We'd be in an event in LA and I would wake up and I'd be like, I just had another birth father dream yeah. where I would meet these random imagine 
imagination birth fathers in my dream. And Tony, I think, was like, she needs to just quit dreaming because this is probably never going to happen. But to, yeah, thanks, Tony, for being on this journey with me, but also really, really, really special people to have you here on the podcast. So cool. Well, it's been awesome. And aside from my journey and my story and stuff, I'm grateful for the both of you and the work that you do in this space to enlighten others, encourage others, inspire others, and do it in a very positive way and non-judgmental way. I think there needs to be more of that as anybody in this space or thinking about stepping into a healthier plant-based lifestyle doesn't need to be judged. They don't need to be beaten up in the process. They need to be encouraged and nurtured. And I think you guys do a fabulous job at that. So I'm grateful for you guys. And thank you for all your work. Now you're making Tony smile off in the corner. I'm in the corner (laughs) smiling. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all for tuning into this a little bit different, but very meaningful episode. It means the world to have you as our podcast family and hope you found some inspiration. Within this episode, we try and keep things really friendly and upbeat. That's the whole purpose of this podcast, but also to stay very real and authentic and talk about the real life struggles of plant-based living, but also of life that we all endure. So this is one of them. And I hope that it left you with something that can help you along your life path. I also wanted to thank you for being on this journey of life with us. I know that Even for me, when I follow people online, I get to see their happy moments and their life seems so perfect and beautiful, but that's just not, that's just not true. And although it may seem that Michelle and I have a pretty curated Instagram feed, we do suffer. And to have you support us in both the moments of joy, but also the moments of extreme grief means the world to us. So thank you for being on this journey with us, good and bad, and for listening to this story and being inspired by Greg, continuing his smiling at everyone who sees you. We just appreciate it so much. Yeah. And I also want to say thank you to you, Tony, because this is this was Tony's idea to re-release this episode. And I was thinking, no, I, why are we doing that? But I know that I will personally be able to look back on this and have it be really special that not only did we record this, but also at such a raw time where everything is still so close to my heart and our hearts. So thank you, Tony. I also am going to, again, be including everything in the show notes and Michelle will put anything that Greg has ever helped her with so that you can watch the videos, see the recipes and generally just appreciate his content. Yep. The recipes are really, really amazing. They're some of my favorites on the planet. So I hope you've checked that out. And if you see the videos, I forgot to mention earlier when we went skydiving, uh, we jumped out of the plane. I was wearing a cow onesie (laughs) and Beepaw was wearing a chicken onesie. So you can see a fluffy chicken onesie Beepaw falling from the sky. (laughs) All right. Well, we'll leave you on that positive, happy note. Remember to smile and again, we thank you. Love you. Bye. Bye.